this day of year. And we're going to spend the next few minutes talking on this subject, uh, keep the lawnmower running and cutting. Now, lots of folks have lots of different kinds of lawnmowers. You know, you can have real type lawnmowers that are human powered that you just roll under the human power. They don't have a motor on them to provide the push. Uh, you've got the, the, the old style, I say old style, this is not certainly an old lawnmower, but the style of lawnmower had changed a lot. The walk behind or the push rotary mower cuts about 20, you know, cut anywhere from a 21 to a 22 inch half. And you get some that go a little bit larger. Then you've got the ride on type mower, you've got the tractor types, where you've got the, the deck mounted in the center and the mower and the motor up front, and you sit behind it kind of like you would on, on a farm tractor, just on a much smaller version. You have garden tractors, which are larger versions of the lawn tractor that have heavier transmissions and wheels and stuff so you can handle a heavier load. And then you've got the sure enough grass cutters and zero turn mowers and so on. Now they all have some things in common. Okay, all rotary mowers turn, they, they cut by spinning a blade. That's how they cut. Uh, they all run with a gasoline engine. There are electric powered uh, uh, lawn mowers out there. But we're focusing today on gasoline powered mowers, mowers and how to keep these things running. You can spend, you know, pretty much name your budget. You can start low. Uh, $150 up to six, seven, eight hundred, even thousand dollars on a walk behind lawn, on a small walk behind lawn more like this. So you can have a substantial investment in one, and so that being the case, you'd like for it to run and perform as long as possible. You take care of a car, all right, or I hope you anyway, take care of a car, and these things have some of the same uh, qualities, characteristics in common with the car, and if you will take care of those maintenance things, you can extend the life of these machines for a quarter period of time. You know, I heard someone say that one of the best ways to, to pick out the next lawnmower to buy is to go down to the junkyard and look at all the ones that are piled up down there. Because you can certainly find lots of them that have been scrapped for a variety of reasons. Uh, very often it's due to owner negligence. It's the reason they're thrown away, the reason they're scrapped. They get to the point where they don't run, they don't perform anymore. So what does it take then for these things to run? So we're talking about keeping them running and keeping them cutting. For a gasoline powered motor like this, we're talking about a motor that's called a four cycle motor, all right? The reason it's called a four cycle motor, a four stroke cycle motor, I guess to be technically correct about it, is because this engine goes through four strokes in order to complete one cycle of operation. All right, that's why it's called now, what does it take for this for this motor to run? It really takes three things. It takes air, and it takes fuel. In this case, the fuel is gasoline, and it takes something to ignite that gasoline. So a spark of some sort, some fire. And it's provided through the spark plug on this thing. Now, so you've got you've got gasoline, you've got air, those two are mixed together, all right, to create an atomized mixture. And that's what explodes inside here. It's called an internal combustion motor, a four-stroke cycle internal combustion motor. So you have an explosion, combustion taking place inside the motor. And it forces this piston up and down in here to cause this thing to turn around and around, okay? And when it turns around and around, the blades turn around and around. So it takes those things. If you take away one of those things, then it's not going to run, okay? Now, it also takes, in order to keep it running, it takes lubrication inside the motor. And that's in the form of oil, and that's to keep those moving parts from building up excessive friction and causing them to seize up, to get through lock the well together, to burn up, if you will. So those are the things it takes to keep those things running. You can, you can have a big influence on the longevity of the motor and of its operation by following a few simple tips. And, and, and the first place to look for those is gonna be inside your owner's manual. When you buy a lawnmower, it doesn't care, I don't care if it's a, a walk behind lawnmower, if it's a big zero turn with a 60 inch head, you're going to get owner's manual. And typically, typically you'll get two. You get a manual for the mower, the complete unit, and then very typically you're going to get a manual for the engine. Okay, the, the motors are typically not produced by the same company that builds the entire unit. So this particular lawnmower has a Kohler brand motor on it. You could have one with a Kawasaki brand motor. You could have one with um, a Briggs and Stratton brand motor. Or it could be a Honda brand motor, etc. Subaru, Robbins, 
all sorts of different kinds. And then there are generics of those things as well. They will typically have a manual that goes along with that motor, which is included along with the unit itself. But so these things are very good to tell, as far as it's telling you what it is you can do from a maintenance standpoint to keep them running and operating. The, the manual itself goes through the details of how you put oil in the thing, okay? How you check the oil, how you can uh, change spark plugs, etc. How to operate, how to start it, how to turn it off and on. Okay, because everyone's a little bit different. Okay, but they all have those things in common, and checking out those things in the manual will tell you how to go about uh, keeping the thing running, how to check the oil, how to change the oil, how to clean the air filter, and so on. So, read the book. How many of you ever read your lawnmower manual? I see two hands. Mm -hmm. I do, I'm a teacher. <laughs> you know, I go to church with a lady, she's very nice. Very fine lady. Good lady, she'll help you out any way you can. So she, she says, you know, could you could you sharpen my lawnmower blade? So I'm sure be glad to service that. So it did. Well, I found out, you know, checking the oil and things, you gotta ride on the mower. Well, gosh, it was it was nearly a quarter of oil low. And I'm gonna call her name and says, man, I said, you, you know, do you ever check the oil in this? It's low. Well, I know you're supposed to. Well, sure you do. Sure you do. You check, you check oil in these motors just like you any other motor. But, so how to do it, the manual tells you. How kind of oil do you put in there? The manual tells you that. How much oil do you put in there? The manual tells you that, okay? So you wanna pay attention to those kinds of things. Now, we're talking about the fact that it's gotta have gasoline, it's got to put fuel, it's gotta have air, and it's got to have uh, a spark in order to move. From an air standpoint, just for a second, you know, it's that, it's that fuel and air mixture that actually burns and explodes inside. Spark plugging lines. Any idea how much air it takes to operate to, to, to burn that gasoline? You know, this thing's got a small gasoline tank on it. It won't hold a gallon of gasoline. Uh, it holds way less than a gallon. But, but how much air would it take to burn a gallon of gasoline? Well, estimated somewhere in the neighborhood for every gallon of gasoline, the equivalent of 10,000 gallons of air. So you've got a very big ratio there between the amount of air compared to the amount of fuel. It takes a lot of air to burn these things. So they have to breathe, okay? They have to get air in. Now, the fact that they're taking the air from the outside means that they're taking it from a dirty environment. All right, these things are gonna suck air in. They're gonna suck it in. And since, the fuel and the air mixing together to form the mixture that burns, it comes through the fuel metering device or the fuel feeding device. And these things are called a carburetor. So somewhere located around that carburetor is going to be the air intake where this engine pulls the air in and mixes it with that fuel. Well, also along with that will be a filter to clean that air, to try to catch dirt because we don't mow grass inside. We operate outside where it's dirt. You know, what's the outside made, made of dirt? All right, the outside is made out of dirt. Exactly, that's what it is. So when you're mowing grass out there, you're kicking up dust, you know, especially over the last week, we've had 90 degree plus temperatures, no rain to speak of in the last week, things dry up really fast. So you mow in dry conditions, you get a lot of dust, a lot of debris blowing around in the air. And this thing, you're breathing it in, okay? If you don't have a mask on, you're taking it in, all right? To some extent, the mower is too. So how does it clean that? It does it with an air filter. Air filters, they come in different versions depending on the motor, but typically they're going to be made out of either foam or paper, or a combination of a foam and paper filament, uh, element together. So here, this is where the air filter is on this particular motor. If you've got a riding motor, you may have a two-cylinder motor on it, it's still the same thing. It's gonna have a carburetor, it's gonna have an air filter on it somewhere. So it's pretty simple, and this is something anybody can do. You can check the air filter, and you should check it periodically. You know, when, when the grass in the springtime, when everything is nice and growing well, you typically don't have as much dust as you do this time of year. So you don't, you, you don't dirty these air filters up. But here's what this air filter looks like. It's just a pleated paper element, lots and lots of folds across here. The reason it's folded like this is to create more surface area so that it can pull air in and you've got more surface area to catch dust and dirt. 
So, you know, you can tell this is not clean because it was dirty, right? But if you tap it, you see still flying off because this is trash and it's caught from the air and it's keeping it from being pulled into a little air intake, all right? You got a little carburetor that sits under here that the fuel and the air is mixed together pushed into the cylinder so that it can be ignited by the spark plug. All right, so how often should you change one of these? You know, if it gets dirty enough, and it's amazing how much abuse the little motors can take, but that you can have a very dirty air filter and it can keep your room, but it runs poor. Okay, it runs poor. Keeping a clean air filter in it is a good way to extend the life of the motor because when it gets to running poorly like this, uh, it puts strain on it, okay? And it causes premature wear. It would not occur otherwise. So this, these are very simple. You know, you can just replace them. These are not, typically, your manual will tell you, you don't really clean things. Typically, the manual will tell you don't use high pressure air on them, blow them out. It makes sense. You take an air hose, blow this thing out. And you know what? Probably some of them are done that way. I'll be honest with you, I've done it before too. In a pinch. All right. I figure a little air filter is better than no air filter at all. You haven't got one and you know, exactly. You haven't got one that's nasty. Yeah. And 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 that's okay. Every once in a while, I guess, but typically they tell you don't blow because because you can damage, tear the paper filters in here, these things paper and all this is a heavy duty paper. And it will then make tears in there to allow bigger pieces of patch to not be caught up on that's the reason for that. So you just you just buy them, you know, to get a replacement. They're simple, easy to put in. Your dealer that you bought it from, uh, they're gonna have it there. So you just get a new one. So here's what they look like. A brand new one, a clean one, compared to a dirty one. You can tell there's a lot of dirt. You know, this thing you can breathe a lot of dust, a lot of air. And this lot more doesn't get used a whole lot. It's pulled in that kind of that. So it's just a simple matter to change that, to put it back in, just like it came out. It's in like so. Put your little piece here, your cover back on here. still runs fine yeah. like that. Now when it gets to the point where it's just this is almost black, that's when you if you start to influence how much air this thing takes in. And you know when you do things in front of people <laughs> <laughs> it never works like it wanted to. Right. Okay. There we go. So does every lawnmower have an air filter? Every lawnmower has an air filter. No, every lawnmower comes. Do, it, do all people leave them on there? No. Some people take them off of those things and they take it off and then they burn the motors because it's something like dirt in there and tear it uh, And not all filters are like this. Not all filters are paper. Some so are is, that, is that probably where they would be on the side of a lawnmower? It's going to be uh, on the side somewhere. Occasionally you may find one that opens to the top. Okay, but it's going to be on one side. And it's going to be, tell you what, where your oil dipstick is. Typically, it's going to be opposite side from the oil dipstick. That's that's where the filter, air filter, will be. You'll check your oil on one side, air filter will be on the other side. Okay. Would you now, say on average, change it once a year? Or your your book will tell you. It'll tell you like check it, uh, uh, clean it every twenty-five hours. Oh. You know, something like that. Or more often in dusty conditions, in dirty conditions. So in the spring of the year, when things are nice and lush, you know, cool temperature, you got a lot of moisture, it's not as dry. You don't kick up as much dirt. This time of year, you got drier conditions, you're going to create more dust. In the fall, when you start chopping the leaves, you create more dust. So then at that point, you may have to check it a little more regularly clean. If you have a foam filter, some of these filters are made out of foam. You can wash them. They're reusable. You wash them with detergent. Detergent and water. Detergent and water, squeeze them out really good, let them dry, and then the directions in your owner's manual will tell you to add a few drops of clean motor oil 
give to it it's like a sponge and work it in there because then that oil impregnated into that sponge helps to catch those particles. Okay, so those can be reused over and over again until they get wear out. All right, so that's the, that's the air part. You gotta make sure you get plenty of air and you do that by keeping a clean filter. Again, the manual tells you how often you should check it. Uh, it doesn't hurt to check it. Uh, I mean, you can't check one too often. All right, but you know what? These things come apart and go together so many times, we tear them up. So you just want to take it off probably every time you know. Um, so the next thing then, gasoline. All right, gasoline, that's a simple thing, right? You go again, gas station, buy gasoline. Now, gasoline today, have typically, in most places, has a little ethanol added to it, a little alcohol in it. Uh, many, in most of these motors, the owner's manual will tell you that you can go up to 10% ethanol. You can use gasoline. Uh, you can use the lowest grade, like 87 octane gasoline. You don't have to go higher, you know, higher octane gas. It doesn't require that. But they will also tell you to avoid using old gas or stale gas. Okay, so if you when you go to the gas station, you buy gas, you want to buy a jug or a can of some kind, you're gonna bring it home. How long will that gallon or that, that jug, it may be a five gallon jug, it may be a two and a half gallon jug, it may be a gallon jug. How long will that jug of gas last you. Okay? If it's gonna last you 30 days or more, then you're thinking about that that's borderline starting to become stable. Potential the gas becomes stable. What does that mean stable? That means that those the, 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 the lightest and the most volatile hydrocarbons that make up that are part of that gasoline part that actually burns have started to leave you have lost those. So it does not ignite as really as it wants to be. So a way to mitigate that is to use a stabilizer, a fuel stabilizer. There, there's more than one brand out there. Stabil, S-T-A-B-I-L is a brand. This is a Starcon brand. My life, they all work fine. This one is also, what they'll do is they will allow you to, to store gas, a lean, for a longer period of time and it remains fresh. You don't, it does not become stable. And this one also has an enzyme added to it to help mitigate any potential negative effects of alcohol that it can have on some components in these small engines over a period of time. So it's a good idea to have this and just add it to a can of gasoline when you buy a can of gasoline. And it'll tell you, you can uh, add one fluid ounce for every three gallons of gasoline. And it will help keep that gas fresh and allow you to store it for a much longer period of time. It's also not a bad idea when you, you finish using this lawnmower in, in, in the fall of the year, you're there on for the last time, to run, uh, to add some uh, of this uh, uh, stainless or, or this, this stabilizer into your fuel tank, crank it up, let it run, circulate through there, to help it from forming gum and deposits in the carburetor while it sits there at eye level. That's just a good way to help keep things. So that when you're ready to start next spring, you can have the first running lawnmower. You know, it'll start for you. And folks that don't do it very often will find that their carburetor has gummed up and it won't run. They have to take it into the shop to get it serviced uh, in order to get that carburetor clean and get it started. So th that's something that anybody can do to avoid that problem. So clean gas, clean air, all right, and spark. That's the other thing. That's, that's the third thing that's necessary in order for this motor to run. Well, the spark is supplied. You know, this motor's got a coil in here it's got a magnet on a flywheel and it's got a copper coil, a wire coil. And that magnet spins around, it creates an electrical field and it generates enough electricity to run through and cause this spark plug to fire. So this is the end, this, this thing screws into the head of the motor and this is extended down into the top of the cylinder and as that piston turns around in that motor, it takes in a fuel air mixture and pushes it to the top. It compresses it, puts it under pressure, and at the right point, when this thing fires, the spark explodes that, forces it back down, and it keeps the cycle running like that. Your motor's manual will tell you that you should uh, check these things uh, or replace them once a year. Now, it's not, it's not common for spark plugs to wear out, however, if you have a dirty air filter, where and that, and what does that do? Well, it changes the fuel and the air mixture, 
okay, because it's not pulling in as much air as it once did. So the fuel air ratio burning in the motor changes because it's not taking as much air as it was before because of dirt. And so that change, sometimes it will start to build up, they call it that mixture change, and build carbon up on the, on the spark plug. And that will influence how readily this thing fires. So it's recommended, most owners of manual to change once a year. Okay? It's not a hard thing to do. It takes a wrench that will fit the spark plug, typically you know, a socket, and, and spark plugs come in different sizes, different diameters. So you'll need one to fit yours. But if you a deep well socket, slide down over this thing and allow you to take it out of the machine. You know, genetics have an have impact in all of our lives. My father, when he became older, his skin got very thin, he's bumping on things and, and I have inherited his skin. So anytime I don't want to get blood all over the place, I'm gonna work around something like this. It's a good idea for me to put these gloves on so I'm gonna skin myself. Alright, so and this is just just like any other nut or bolt, you know, righty tighty lifty loose. Just use a standard ratchet. Is it dark colored? It is, but you got to think, you know, how many times this thing fired over the last few moments to ignite that fuel and air mixture? Uh, it's a dark color. That's okay. You expect it to be dark because you're, it, it's creating a, an explosion in there. It's going to have some, some carbon buildup, but it's not very much carbon buildup. And the very end here, you've got this little, this strap that comes up over the top of this electrode. That space has to be it, there's, a, there's a specified distance between that electrode and that little strap. And, and the, the, the motor manual tells you that. In this case, for this particular spark plug, it says it's 0 0.03 inches. Well, you can use a thing called a spark plug reach or gap, a spark plug gap tool. And it will allow you, it's got little different gauges on here, of here it is 0.30 excuse me, 0.03 inches, and you check the gap. Look, look at it, if you're gonna change the spark plug, it may be set at the right gap, it may not be. Now this one is good, right? And what that means is you can slide that through there, but it's, it, it's, it has some resistance to it, tight, but it's tight, but it fits through there. But let's just say that this was not set at the correct gap. I'm gonna put this back. When something ain't broken, there's no point to fix it. I'm not gonna fix that one, but I have another one up here I will fix. But the way, uh, the way you do that, and again, you know, the righty tight and left loosey, put it in there. You wanna tighten it up good. It's, uh, it's very embarrassing if you're ever mowing your lawn, you have a loose spark plug, and it blows it out across the yard. <laughs> and it hits the dog and it wakes the dog up and disturbs his nap. Or it shoots it into uh, the windshield in your automobile or through your window and the, the, the picture window in the dining room and so on. So, here's a little spark plug. I want to get this thing to uh, 0 .3, 0 0.03 inches. So I come to 0 0.03, find it right here. So I slide it through. All right, it's tight, it doesn't want to go. So I need to, I need to open that gap up a little bit. So on either end, or on, on two sides of this tool, there is a little gapping device where you can bend this electrode. And you slide it in there, and just bend it up a little bit. slides through, and I've got a gap of 0.03 inches. So this is 
set the way that the manufacturer said it should be in order for us, for me to, for, for this thing to ruin it at its potential, okay? So, and you, you can find these, you, you go to a park store, a lot of times we'll be sitting at the counter at checkout, kind of like candy and things at the grocery store at checkout, well, these will be there, along with air freshener and all kinds of stuff. Very cheap, very inexpensive. It's a good idea to have one. And again, it doesn't matter if you've got a two-cylinder motor, you're gonna have two spark plugs. So if you've got a ride-on motor, zero-turn motor, two-cylinder motor, have two spark plugs in it, because you've got a plug for every cylinder that you have there. But they're all the same. Okay, the principle, the process is the same for every one. And then the oil, in order to keep things lubricated, okay? There was a time when lawnmowers didn't have dipsticks, like cars, Take <laughs> Check the oil, but today most of them have a dipstick of some sort. So here's the dipstick on this, and your manual will tell you when you check the oil that what you want to do is you unscrew it, you pull it out, you wipe it off, and then it's just like an automobile dipstick, and you can't see it from where you're sitting. But it'll have a, a low and a high mark or a full mark. And, and then it's got a space between the low and the full. As long as it's in that space there, it's good. If it falls below that space, then you need to add oil to it. Okay? So it says to pull it out, to wipe it clean, and then to reinsert it, but do not tighten it up. Okay? Because if you tighten it up, you put it further down into the oil tube, and that can influence it's supposed to be checked at this level. All right, so if you screw it in there, it could be a thick low, but it's showing that it's not low because you screwed it further into the tube. So you pull it out, it's hard to see. The oil is dark and the stick is dark, but it falls into that good zone. It's a little checkered area in there, so it's good to go. Well, what if, what if it's low? Well, you want to add a little oil to it. What kind of oil do you use? Owner's manual tells you that. And very often it gives you options or choices. A very common oil is one that's called 30 weight oil, SAE 30. Okay? Now you'll also see oil recommendation will have a W in it, like a 10 W 30. Alright, well that means the W is, is stands for winter and it can be used in colder temperatures. Right, it can also be used in warmer temperatures, but those standard weight oils like say 30 weight doesn't have the W in front of it, but the manual says that it's good for temperatures, uh, you know, from summertime weather down to cooler temperatures, 40 degrees, thereabouts, somewhere along in there. If you're going to operate in cold weather, then you might want to use a different weight oil. But the manual tells you that. Okay? <coughs> if you're not figuring on blowing snow and scraping ice and so on, typically you use same weight oil all year round. All right, 30 weight oil is a common weight oil for you. It tells you that right here in the oil container. What kind of it is? This is SE30, okay, 30 weight motor oil. The, mo the manual tell you how much oil it needs. Like this one, I think, holds 22 ounces. That's how much oil this thing will hold. The manual will also tell you how frequently to change the oil. Changing the oil is not a real big problem because on a deal on, on one more like this one, you change it, you pour it out through the check tube right here. You pull that out. Get an oil pan like this. The reason is it's kind of handy. I mean, you catch anything that you can pour it into, that's fine and good. But this is a good thing because it's shallow and it will hold several quarts of oil. You know, this thing will hold 22 ounces, so it holds way less than a quart. But also, you've got four spout on it, so you can pour it into a jug and then take it down and go recycle it. A lot of park stores, auto park stores, will have a place to have a, a they will take your old oil and recycle it for you. So you don't have to. You don't have to worry about uh, sending it off somewhere else. You can just take it there and it'll recycle it. But the way you change that oil is you start the mower, let it run, get warm, okay, because that warm oil flows better, and then turn it off, pull the spark plug, or not the spark plug, pull the uh, uh, dipstick out, turn this thing up on its side, catch the oil, drain it out. And then once it's all drained out, put it back, uh, set it back upright. So it's back with oil. It'll tell you, you put it back in the same place. Okay, there's only one place you can access this oil reservoir here. Put that oil in. Okay, it goes down into the oil. 
So there's not a plug on the bottom like in a car that you have to loosen? You know what? Most all of them will have a plug on it, but the manual tells you to drain it through the tube. Okay. Right there. Now, you know what? I don't know if this one has not. We'll turn and look at it in just a second. Uh, so that's, those are the things, you know, you take care of up here. You, you, you keep fresh gas, clean gas, clean air. You make sure it's got spark. Well, that keeps it running, okay? Those are the essential things to keep it running. And then the lubrication in there to keep it running for a long time so it doesn't wear out. But what about the cutting aspect of the question? Oh, Mitchell, I was just uh, didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, the plug underneath the bottom of it, the reason why you got to be careful about using that is because of the aluminum uh, blocks of the engine. You They're real it. easy to strip. Yeah. 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 And but plus, they'll see you. Some people do, yeah. And, and they'll, they're, it's, it's fairly easy, I think, uh, to, slip, to get those cross threaded. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. And, and, then, it, and then you've got a real problem. But changing the oil is it's pretty simple. Okay, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. I promise you. So, we keep it running. But what about the cutting aspect of it? So, I like to show this picture. It's not a great picture. Yes. You see, you see the grass? So the question is, are they cutting this grass or are they beating it into submission? <laughs> well, this, this is a very poor cut. You can see the ends of the grass blades. What color are the ends of the grass blades? Yeah. They're brown, painted, whitish color. Why? And they're jagged. Why? Because they were cut with a very dull ball. A very dull ball. Now, the thing to remember is that well, we'll just turn it up here so we look at it. I need to swap in here again. You need me to help you. Now, I think I'll just be a little more careful this time. But the, the man will also tell you if you're going to turn this thing on its edge, which way to turn it. Typically, you're going to turn it with the dipstick down. Okay? So you turn it with the dipstick down. So I rotate it around here so I can turn it with the dipstick down. So to get to the blade, turn this thing on. Okay. <laughs> the way these things are cut, the only sharp part of this blade is out here on the end. You got a sharp part here. You got a sharpened part there. And that what that's what cuts the grass. So this thing spins around. It's some predetermined revolution per minute. As fast as the motor runs, that's how fast the blades. And it cuts the tops of the blades off. So there's nothing holding that up there to cut it, except a little bit what what <coughs> lift you get created by this thing spinning around over there. And it spins pretty fast, you know, probably 32, 3300 revolutions per minute. So you got some air moving up there. Um, so a dull blade literally beats the end of the grass blades off. It doesn't cut them very well. If you want the absolute best cut quality, a real mower does the best job because the real mowers, the blades don't move. The cutting blade on a real mower station, the real part that turns, that has those twisted blades on the reel, well those aren't cutting blades. What they do is they catch the grass and pull it against this cutting bar down. And it cuts the grass like scissors, gives a very quality cut. So a, a, if you want the absolute highest quality cut, a real mower will do that. Rotary mower is much faster. It, it, it cuts a, a, a wide variety of terrain. Typically, real mo uh, rotary mowers like this one, you can adjust the cutting height. Each wheel has an adjustment on it, so you can raise it up and down. You can cut low, you can cut high. Most real mowers, most real mowers, don't have that level of adjustment to them, so it takes up. Uh, uh, it, it takes a good smooth yard, okay, because you have a rough yard, uneven yard, what happens? If you're cutting very close, you scout places, right? You get, you get the high parts with the blade and so on, and that wears them out faster. So the rotary board is by far the most common one. Now, in order to sharpen the blade, you've got to take it off, okay? You have to take it off. So, they, you know, some have a single nut or bolt through here, because on this one has two. All right, it has two. So again, it takes a socket, correct side. This one's a 916. Put it on. Now, as you turn this thing, it'll shoot the blade. 
How long do you know? You got a whole blade. Well, it's very sharp. You know how you hold that? How you hold that? A pretty good tool to have is, is this little thing right here. It's just a blade lock. You can pick these up at a lot of places that sell uh, long more supplies. It's a handy tool. It slides over like this, locks down, and it holds that blade for you so that you can remove it very easily. Always try to disconnect the plug. You know what? That's a great point. You should. And I would be remiss to not do that. So it's because all it takes to start. Yeah. All it takes to start this thing is you, you get that motor turned up to pull a little gas in there and fire, it will start. You know, you don't have to get a key. Alright, so you pull the spark fluid wire off so there's no danger of accident on fire. Thank you for saying that. You should always do that. Always do that. So we tighten this thing up pretty good. And now it will hold it here as we can take this off. Now, sometimes if it hasn't been removed for it can be tight. You know, if the last person to put it on was, was, was getting ready for a strongman contest, they may try to really shower down on that thing. So, a good handy tool to have is a ratchet with a longer handle on it. It gives you, it gives you more leverage, all right? And maybe you weren't fortunate enough to find one on the side of the road like I was, and you don't have one. But if you have a piece of pipe, it will slide over the end of your reach here, your ratchet do the same thing. So you can use that to give you that added leverage there too. So, you take the blade off. Typically, once you get them loose, then you can just, uh, you can just remove them by hand. This has this bracket that slides up over there to hold it in place. And so now the blade will come off. Okay. And that, you can leave that there. You can slide it right back in so it'll hold it and you tie it back up again. So, the cutting blade, the cutting part of the blade. Here it cuts. And here it cuts. All right. This is a, a mulching blade. You know, all mulching blades are made this way. But they're, they're designed to keep the grass clipping suspended up under this deck after they're cut off so they can be chopped up a little more before they're deposited back down so they'll be the back. That's all the most of the blades are. Typically no lawnmower style blades, they're all just flat straight blades. And they cut grass fine. And they still cut grass fine. But this one uh, does have the, the, the lift and the wings on it there to try to help keep that, those grass clippings up and, and not fall back down. So, you only sharpen the edges. All right, you can sharpen a lot of things. You could use, uh, I mean, a fast way to do it is with a grinder. You know, a handheld angle grinder like this works very well. Um, it's, you want to wear eye protection. Because you're going to throw a lot of sparks, so it's a good idea to wear eye protection if you're going to use something like that. But you can also do it with a hand file. Now, I sharpened one side of this blade already. And in, in this blade, this side has not been sharpened. Um, if you look at it, you know, it, there's, there's not a lot blemishes on this part. If you look at the edge of it, it's not nicked up or anything. But but this blade, will a lot more blade last all summer long without being too sharp? Typically no. No. I mean the act of cutting the grass dulls the blade. Okay, now if you get rocks, if you get sticks, things like that, that dulls it faster. Dulls it faster. So in order to keep a sharp blade, you either have to remove the blade that's there and sharpen it numerous times, or what you still have to sharpen, or you have a couple of blades. And you, you keep one sharpened all the time, so you can change one, go back to mow it, and then sharpen them. You always have a sharp blade to change back to. But anybody can sharpen a mower blade. It's, it's not hard to do. And again, just a file will do it. It's nice, it's nice to have a, uh, a, a, a vise or a, some kind of clamp to put this in and hold it steady for you. But if you don't, I mean, you can you can hold it steady just against a bench. You know, I'll try to move around where you can see a little bit better. But this thing comes with 
with a, a bevel, all right? It's ground, and for that cutting edge, you want to maintain that same angle. You don't want to change the angle of the cutting. So, whether you're using a grinder, whether you're using a hand file like this, you want to turn the blade and, and the file so that you're following that same angle. In your own place, you're removing metal, because that's what you do when you sharpen, you're removing a little bit of metal, put that edge back to it, is where the bevel is. So, so a few passes, and I removed a fair amount of metal already. Okay, so I've got that one shined up a little bit. We're going to, now this has got a little nick in it right here. And this is where a grinder comes in off the handy because what you can do then is take that grinder, just go right along the edge and remove that nick, all right? And then take it and work it back out sharp again. We can do a pretty good job just like this. You're not going to shave with this. They're going to have to be sharp enough to shave with you. You have functional sharpness. Typically, the sharp, if you get a really, really sharp edge on here, it'll build a little faster because you don't have as much metal on that edge and it doesn't take as much to build it again. So you don't want a razor sharp edge on it. But you do want it uh, with, with you know, some degree of sharpness. You buy a brand new more blade, you feel it, it's not super sharp. Okay, it's not going to be super sharp. But, so you are removing metal. Albeit it may not be a lot, if you use a grinder, you remove it faster. So you can remove more metal in a hurry. So, the fact that you're removing metal off either end, you would like to keep the thing relatively balanced. Roughly the same weight on one end as it is on the other. Because, if you don't, Look at that too close to cut you. <laughs> if you don't, if, you, if one side is lighter than the other, you put this on here, this is connected directly to the crankshaft on that motor. So it's a little bit out of balance. It will set up a vibration that thing spins, it will wear it out faster. Now, if you can get it so out of balance that this thing just shakes, you don't want that. So how do you know it's balanced? You can get a very simple little thing, it's got a blade balancer. A little cone like this. Sets together like that. Um, set it down. Sharpen your blade. You set it on there. See how it balances. So as long as it's you know stays the same, you're okay. If it tilts down to this side, what does that tilt? Well, that side is heavier than this side. So we need to take a little more metal off of that side. We need to sharpen on that side. File on that side. Grind on that side a little bit more. Okay. These are very inexpensive. You know, again, you can go into places that sell supplies like this. Uh, uh, TSC, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, Co-op, all those kinds of places. You go into the lawnmower shops, you can buy these things. So get a, get a uh, blade lock and get a balance. Great little tools to have. Great little tools to have. But if you don't have one, you sharpen your mower blade, you'd like to know if it's fairly balanced or not. Can you do anything else? Sure you could. You could, if you have a, a, a post, if you have a shed, if you've got a deck post, it's anything, you can drive a nail in and hang it on the head of that nail, that center, you know, it'll kind of do the same thing. If it goes to one side or the other, then that side's heavy. So you will, you will file it off a little bit more and put it back on. So, you sharpen the blade, you put the edge back to it, we kept the same bevel we had before. We didn't alter that angle any. We're going to put it back on. If you put it upside down, it doesn't cut worth the dime. Okay. You can put it on. Many blades you put it upside down. This one is kind of folded, so it will not fit as easily. But, so this part here, the cutting part, it needs to be in contact with the grass, right? So it's spinning around, and this part is cutting, this part is hitting the grass, and it spins around like that. That's what's going to take. So, Put it back together. So when I 
I put it here, the edge is going to be towards the grass, right? So you line back up. It's not a bad idea. Uh, have a little spray lubricant of some kind, WD-40, whatever, that's just the brand. And, and put back on your nuts, or on the boat itself. Allow those to go back on easily. nothing holding that grass blade up except maybe a little lip that's created by the air movement and the shape of this deck. Anything that takes away from that can influence the quality of cut. So if you have grass built up under the deck, and it will build up under there at some point, you need to remove it. So it's after, after mowing, it's always good to check. And if it takes something, you know, just a paint scraper, a 